I found one poison. poison. Do you know how to restore it? It's like a plant. This is cool. How are you feeling, dude? Still feeling sick? It was a magic sword. Of course I'm still sick. All the more reason for you to stay in bed and rest. But I need to work on, on the, the show. On the show, right. No, you don't. You need to worry about getting better. I have no idea how long it's going to take to get you back to full strength, so I better not see you out of bed until then. <sighs> what are you? My mother? No, your doctor. Now, I have stuff for making soup for later, and I bought you a few new books to relax with. Are you sure that's enough? Okay. I'm going to be downstairs. Try to get some sleep, but call me if you need anything, all right? <sighs> Thanks, Doc. I couldn't help but blame myself for what had happened. My best friend was bedridden, left feeble against some clown with a sword. Crimson explained that the attack was over before it began, and that his magic sword had been stolen. I knew I likely wouldn't have tipped the scales much in one direction or the other, but I still felt like I should have been there. It was quiet in the house now. The hollow serenity of the moment left me alone with my thoughts, and that was always a recipe for a nightmare. Video games were my salvation now. And there was one in particular that I felt drawn to like a magnet. Max Payne. Released by Remedy Studios in 2001 and written by visionary Sam Lake, the original Max Payne brought a mix of film noir and John Woo inspired action that I hadn't experienced before or since. The creative use of bullet time, the sharply written characters, and the flowing narrative made this a game worth playing over and over, something which I found myself doing on several occasions. Some say that video games are a violent hole people crawl into. Right now, that sounded divine. And then I remembered that this game had been poorly converted into a movie as well, starring the plant whisperer himself, Mark Wahlberg. Having come out in 2008, the movie made a profit of $85 million, a financial success with a $35 million production budget. However, the reviews were so negative that a sequel was unlikely. And considering how little the screenwriters understood of the source material, that was unsurprising. Why they didn't go to Sam Lake to write was beyond me, but I'm not a Hollywood producer. I don't like throwing my money away. How did such an incredible game get perverted into such an obscene mess? I didn't want to think about that movie, but I could feel my mind slipping back towards it, like I was trying to pull myself out of quicksand. The movie doesn't start off well as Wahlberg gives us an opener that makes him sound like a high school emo kid begging for attention. I don't believe in heaven. I believe in pain. I believe in fear. I believe in death. It doesn't help that Wahlberg's performance is as wooden as it is, but I have to remind myself that he has done worse. I'm talking about a completely superfluous bottle of cough syrup, which that's like six bucks. This was unlike the game, which took us straight to the end, police sirens echoing in the blistering winter air as Max gives us his recounting of events. 10-5, please repeat, 10-5, all units, all units, emergency. Officer in danger, Acer Plaza, repeat, Acer Plaza, all units. 
they were all dead. The final gunshot was an exclamation mark to everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger, and then it was over. The game was much more effective, opening with a shock and mysterious dialogue, instead of the sad scribblings of some 15-year-old calling himself Nightwolf. Red letters adorn the front of Police HQ, letting us know that the movie had just finished pretending it understands how to use in medias res. We see that Max now works in the cold case unit, isolated in the belly of Police HQ. After the murder of his wife and infant daughter at the hands of junkies, he surrounds himself with other helpless cases, chasing leads that all lead to decrepit dead ends. He is alone, both emotionally and physically, though again this is an unnecessary departure from the game. There, he transferred to the DEA after he lost his family, working undercover to take down the mob and trace the origins of a new drug, Valkyr, V. It was an epidemic that gave its users a nightmare high and left them in a hysterical panic, spouting gibberish. Payne was already isolated and had a solid understanding of how the mob was organized, with names and faces attached to each lackey and leader. By not following this pattern, the screenwriter has ruined the chance of creating a three-part epic, matching the game's three-act structure and a potential landslide of cash. It was true what they said. Common sense isn't. So what's the story? There is none. But back there you said, listen. His wife and kid were murdered. They never found the guy. That's his story. Remember when you were a kid and you'd hold your breath when you run past the graveyard? People do that? Just, uh... Leave that man alone. We see Roscoe Street Station, a stinking hole of a subway stop with more urine stains than train cars. In the game, this is where Max's friend Alex is murdered right in front of him, and this is where his journey into darkness began. In the movie, this scene is a meaningless show of all flash and no impact. Payne gives us a show of force that took hours of gameplay for him to build up to. The careless disregard is the movie trying to make him look like a loose cannon. He comes across more as a disgruntled office drone who's trying to get fired. He'd have an easier time if he just banged the boss's daughter. Open your eyes. Now! You ever seen this woman? Did you ever hear anyone say anything about this Bill woman? Bill died. Bill died because her wings couldn't last a while. After he runs out of leads, Max visits an old informant of his, and that's where he meets Natasha. Natasha is of very little consequence, a hanging thread on the hem of an unused shirt. She only exists for two reasons, to connect Max to Mona Sachs and to die horribly. Insert your women in refrigerators comment here. Or more accurately, your women in eight different pieces scattered around an alleyway comments. A creeper with a demon's grin named Lupina was seen watching her from the rooftop, and he apparently felt the need to show off his favorite chainsaw up close and personal. Max's old partner, Alex, finds the disgruntled cop the next morning, taking him to the scene of Natasha's murder. I don't believe it. <laughs> what are you two, back together again? And you kiss and make up? Where are we on the weapon? We're nowhere yet. I mean, looks like a blade, but uh, too much blood for that to be right. Hey, O'Brien! The movie was raising more questions than it was answering. Like, what did they really think killed her then? Is there a limit to how much blood a knife can spill? And outside of advancing the plot, why was Natasha even killed in the first place? Why are you showing me this? We found this here. Do you know her, Max? For a man obsessed with the murder of his family, Max does a poor job recognizing the wing tattoo on Natasha's wrist, the very same design that was on the junkies that broke into his home. Fortunately, Alex does recognize it and makes a connection between the two crimes, but races to Max's apartment rather than reveal the info over voicemail. And in a twist that everyone saw coming, Alex is murdered in Max's apartment and Max is suspected of killing his old partner. Max is also attacked by the same guys who killed Alex, who at this point seems to be the Russian mob. This makes as much sense as having a bayonet on a rocket launcher, because the Russian mob becomes one of Max's best resources in the game. 
Compounding this was tying Mona in with the Russians when she was really a hired gun, never really tangling with them until the second game, but that's a whole different ballpark. Why the movie decided to start the Russians as antagonists could be chalked up to xenophobia, an old distrust of communists, falling back on stereotypes, or my personal favorite, they were just being lazy. Max wakes up in the hospital, greeted by his old friend Bibi. In the game, he's one of the only people who knew about Max's undercover assignment. Here, you could almost smell the betrayal plotline heating up. Listen, anything you can remember will help. They got nothing for leads. The whole force has you pegged as the prime suspect. Now you tell them where to find me. Everything they did with him was a mistake, an obvious plotline written within a betrayal of his original character. BB is the head of security for Azer Pharmaceuticals, a miracle company that went nationwide in only a few years. Oh my god. Max. This one. How have you been? Fine, thanks. I hope you know you can always call me. Why would the CEO of a multi-billion corporation remember the husband of a mid-level secretary? This was an attempt to introduce the character of Nicole Horn into the movie and cast her in an innocent light, but when we meet her for the first time in game, she's clearly a power player, an unfeeling businesswoman who knows how to get what she wants. I could tell when I was outgunned. It was time to take another beating. The mystery witch was a real barracuda. Trouble on dagger heels, a smoking assault rifle in her hand, and an army of killer suits behind her. How sweet. I get to kill two birds with one stone. And so we have two characters who would have been best left for the third act of the entire story, but the movie felt the need to shoehorn both of them in. Introduce them early if you must, but at least don't detract from their characters. Things look worse for Max when the shadow looming over Alex's death finally catches up to him. Ah, uh, jeez, watch out for this prank. Detective Max Payne? Jim Bravura, Internal Affairs, I need you to come with me. Bravura is played by Ludacris. Fitting name, considering how much he was changed from the game. Jim Rivera, internal affairs agent. Of course, people know him from the video game. This is a guy that just basically kicks ass and takes names. That's all I do, I'm kicking ass and taking names. Rivera was never internal affairs. He worked homicide and took the lead in tracking Max down, like a hound dog chasing a rabbit. He was really a background character who gave Max a reason to keep running. Rever does the same thing in the movie, but has much more screen time, which would be significant if he ever affected the plot. Instead, he spends the movie fighting for relevance where there's none to be found. With nowhere else to turn to, Max takes a detour to visit Alex's office and comes across the wing tattoo clue and a phone log from Natasha's cell. He had the name of a junkie drug dealer, Owen Green, someone worth a visit. But along the way, he gets jumped by the hired gun, Mona Sachs. Drop your weapon. I was starting to sound like a broken record, but everything about this character was wrong. Mona is supposed to be a femme fatale, a woman as dangerous as she is beautiful. Instead, we had Meg Griffin trying to be tough. First question, who's the biggest, toughest guy in this house? Well, I don't like to toot my own horn, but I believe I hold the distinction of- On second thought, that might actually be more intimidating. Max manages to convince Mona, played by Mila Kunis, to join him, rather than put a bullet in his brain just to help make this movie enjoyably shorter. I heard a call, okay? Almost probably the last person who saw her alive. Yeah? Except for the guy that left his wallet laying by her body. Does that sound like something a homicide cop gets wrong? Whoever killed your sister probably did the same thing to my partner, and maybe I... Look, you want to help? Help me find Owen Green. Max and Mona find themselves in a junky hallway wallpapered with graffiti. At the top floor, Owen was flying high on a dose of Valkyr, so high that he had to shoo away the birds. Owen? <laughs> Owen, look at me. Owen, look at me. I know Natasha called you. You know what happened to her? She's gone. Owen? 
Hold on. Just relax. And like that, he was gone, pulled out by a Valkyrie of Norse myth. The game was loaded with all sorts of Norse myth and nomenclature. Valkyries, the Ragnarok nightclub, Alfred Woden, and others. While the game could be a bit on the nose at a few times, it never talked down to the player, letting them discover these things on their own, if they weren't already familiar. Otherwise, they only had symbolic meanings, which added to the flavor if people noticed, and didn't detract if people didn't. The movie ignores this and just assumes no one watching has ever heard of these things. That's a Norse Valkyrie. Vikings used to wear them for protection. Valkyries fly over the battlefield, picking out the righteous dead. They reward the people who draw first blood. A soldier's angel. The simple change shows a lack of confidence in the audience, and the script suffers as a result. Instead, we get lines that try to be cool, but don't really make sense when put into context. Max Ben, he's been hunting. Three years of kicking down doors. He is looking for something that God wants to stay hidden. And that's what makes him even more dangerous. Mona checks in with an old contact who wasn't in the game, bypassing characters like Vinny Gogniti, Rico Muerte, the Finito brothers, just to get the name Jack Lupino, someone Max is supposed to know already. The devil is building his army. Does this devil have a name? Many. The one you are looking for is Lupino. Meanwhile, Max comes through old files, only to realize the old Azure files his wife had kept had a wing motif as well. Most people would chalk that up to coincidence, but this was enough to make Max look for his wife's old supervisor, a coward named Jason Colvin, another unfamiliar old face who wasn't in the game. The director apparently needed to replace the tapestry of diverse characters the game gave us with these sentient cliches that were sold by the bundle like hot dogs. Max meets with Colvin. He doesn't have much to offer, outside of platitudes and half-baked lies, until Max airs his concerns. It was a military operation. It was something to make soldiers more aggressive in combat. Colvin promises to fold like a poker player with a crap hand, but as Max is escorting him out of the building, security rushes in to get rid of the evidence. The ensuing firefight sends enough lead flying around to build a radiation shelter. As far as video game logic, it's possible that a player could get out of this, but as a live action movie, the scene is all flash and no substance. At first glance, it's a decent scene, until you realize that Max is cornered and the security team never moves in to flank him, when they both outnumber and outgun him. Instead, Max takes a few of them out, grabs the evidence he needed, and only takes a single bullet to the shoulder, which he shrugs off by the next room almost like he actually has regenerating health, which the game did not have. What's next, recharging shields? my whole real life <laughs> sitting in the bad part of the club waiting for booze never come Mona finds Max watching the evidence in a hideaway and they confirm that Valkyr was a combat enhancing drug developed by the Azure Corporation the video they watch is a sales pitch to the US government featuring Sergeant Jack Lapino while this was something that happened in the game the movie makes it much more of a focal point likely a fallback to the cliche evil corporation trope the game used the same idea, but was much smarter than this, pointing out the evil people within the Mafia that trafficked the drug and the corporation that made it. 
instead of relying on tired blanket statements. Frankly, the writing staff for this movie was about as creative as a second grader who was busy chugging paste. You face down a, a group of insurgents and instead of fear, you're, you're filled with uh, peace, I guess. It's like something's watching over you from above. You feel like you have wings. He's in an old club called Ragnarok. You know where it is. Now that Max knows where to go, he loads up for what could very well be the last fight of his life, ignoring the incriminating evidence that he has proving a major company is behind the biggest drug epidemic the city has ever seen. Lupino prepares himself for the battle he can sense is coming, staring down over the city like a predatory bird. The man spends so much time staring down at people from above that it could legitimately be called a character trait. Inside the club, Max gets into a shootout with a few thugs, a tepid shoot -em up that might be more realistic, but doesn't come close to capturing the intensity of the game. Especially since the movie forgot to include music in this scene. The scene does get a little better, lack of music included, during the one bullet time segment, a rather significant feature from the game. It isn't long until Max finds Lupino, hanging from the ceiling like a sweaty bat. You hear them coming. We'll see which one was they're flying for. We'll see which one was they love best. God, you're so blessed. The angels. The angels are not done with you yet! But Lupino made the classic mistake, bringing a knife to a gunfight. The bringer of this anticlimactic moment was none other than Bibi, who starts to lead Max out of the building. Bibi, Bibi, what's going on here? Baby, I looked at Lupino, he didn't know who I was. Uh, what are you doing here? The aforementioned traitor plot comes into the open, with BB admitting he was the one who killed Max's family. What was I supposed to do? Michelle kept nosing around. Some boxes from a dead project went missing. She mentioned it to me without knowing what it really meant. I had to, I had to talk to her. Show her my side before she took it to someone else. Before that night, the things that went wrong for me seemed impossible to do anything about. Michelle was the first problem in my life small enough to reach out and stop. This makes no sense. In the game, three junkies high on V broke in and killed Max's family. Is BB saying that his master plan involved the death of a six-month-old child? BB also came up with the idea of selling Valkyr on the streets. But BB was proud, explaining his genius plan to Max and making one fatal flaw. He starts monologuing. He starts, he starts monologuing. He starts like this prepared speech yeah. about how feeble I am compared to him, how <laughs> inevitable my defeat is, how the world will soon be his. Yada, yada. That's a good thing his father didn't live to see it. The great Bill Payne's only son. A strung out, junkie suicide. It would have eaten him alive. Between the prepared speech and the inept aim of BB and his henchman, Max is able to get away, jumping into the river and escaping in the blinding darkness. If BB knew how to get rid of a body, this would not have been a problem. Max had run through a warehouse full of dead mafia goons. A few bullets to the torso means Max would bleed out and the cops would assume he died in the firefight. End of investigation. And if he was going to kill Max anyway, then why save him from Lupino? Instead, BB has to make things difficult for himself. Salvation can come in many forms. 
For Max, it happened to be the two vials of Valkyr that BB hid in his coat pocket as a frame job. Also, BB being an idiot, but I think I've made my point. And just like Chromosome 24 and Doom, Max is part of the rare 1% of users who gets the full benefit from the movie's MacGuffin, despite blacking out from it in the game. Twice. The quick thinking and drugging himself may have saved Max's life, giving him a more vibrant look against the washed out background. This moment carries us to the finale, and despite BB thinking the coast is clear, he still walks with a squad of bodyguards when all he's doing is trying to outrun the cops who want him for questioning. Max had other plans, though. Oh, shit. He's not dead, he's here. Bullshit! In a shocking twist, the movie almost gets something right showing Max rush in with dual-wielding fury, giving BB a hail of gunfire. What the hell is this? Where the hell you going? A moment which is subsequently ruined with Max's hallucinations. The hallucinations in the game were of acid and blood, while the movie is fire and winged ladies, an annoying mistake since Valkyries do not show up once in-game. Max fights his way through a small army of guards, shooting with strange accuracy for a guy on hallucinatory drugs and shrugging off point-blank shotgun blasts. Mona comes in for a moment to justify Mila Kunis's paycheck, then Max finds BB waiting on the helipad. It's unbelievable, all that snow. And watch it end up being a beautiful day. You want my confession first? Baby bleeds out under Max's feet, and the sun rises in the horizon, guiding Max out of the darkness as the credits begin to roll. But that's not the end of it, as much as I wish it was. A post credit scene shows Max and Mona meeting at a bar, looking over a newspaper article featuring Nicole Horn. Their fight is not yet finished, though despite the sequel bait, this story was. But the greatest shame of the moment was that this captures the final battle of the game, just to kill Bibi, who was just a mid-boss at best. The entire setup of fighting up the Asia building to kill Nicole Horn couldn't be used now, even if Hollywood managed to clench out another steamer. We were sold short in the final battle, which ended with a single shot to Bibi's chest. In the game, Horn was trying to escape via helicopter, so Max dropped a radio tower onto her, which knocked out the helipad, causing the helicopter to fall multiple stories, then have the remains of the helipad crush the helicopter. That would have been so cool! Instead, this weak ending sums up the movie perfectly. A shot in the dark with nothing to aim for. In an industry that's only been getting grittier, Max Payne had a chance to stand tall not just as a movie, but as a trilogy. No such luck, however, since the movie is all flash and no substance. The basic ideas are there, lighting, sounds, effects, but the characters and story are way off their mark. They might have been able to get one more movie out of this franchise, but with the mystery of the Valkyr solved, there was little story to tell. At best, they could spit out an inflated revenge tale against Nicole Horn, but with the writing as flat as this movie was, it could never hope to build to anything. The movie earns a 2 out of 5. The game was the polar opposite. Great characters, fun story, engaging world, meaningful symbolism, dramatic twists, incredible gameplay. I've lost count of how many times I've played through the levels, taken down the mob, helped Max towards revenge. This one's an oldie, but a goodie. Check it out if you've never had the chance. You can still buy it on Steam.
the game earns a 5 out of 5. This crew knew how to tell a story, but not this story. There was so little care taken in capturing the feel of the game that I didn't think they ever looked at it, much less played it. The characters were way off, and that was when they were even included. Noir York City was replaced by a standard big city feel that anyone can find in any big city movie. I can only imagine the utter regret Sam Lake and his crew must have felt when they saw this disaster, a lazy spin of the story they worked so hard to tell. Remedy Studios is built around writers. If only this movie was so lucky. As an adaptation, it gets a 1 out of 5. Life is full of mysteries, most of which never get answered, just like this movie. So many plot points were lost, either to the cutting room floor or because the crew never thought things out. For example, why was Natasha even in this movie when her involvement was largely overwritten by Alex's death? And why did she die? She didn't pose a threat to either Bibi or Lupino, and killing her just helped Max along. Why did she see Valkyries when she died when she was sober and looking for another fix? Jim Brevera, Internal Affairs, I need you to come with me. If they were going to include him as much as they did, then why didn't Bravura have a real part to play? He doesn't contribute anything to the plot. Why did Alex die in an off-screen shootout to the Russians when he was killed by BB in the game, thus adding a personal touch to BB's betrayal? If BB killed Michelle, Max's wife, then why did he also kill Max's daughter? Actually, how did he get the two thugs stoned out of their gourds on V to do what he said and not kill him in a paranoid bender? And finally, why did we have the funeral scene at all? The game skipped anything like that as Max went on a one-man crusade against the Mafia. The movie tried to show us that his quest for revenge just hurt those around him, so of course he turns his life around and completes his revenge quest anyway. I choose to take a similar route in my revenge against Strife, wherever he's hiding. I'll drive a big, honking railroad spike right through his- What? What are you doing here? NPC. Sorry to drop in like this, but you and I need to have a little talk. 